Hello everyone and welcome to Archeo Viking. Today is one or two videos uh, about the War of 1812. Now, uh, I know you're wondering why uh, two videos? Well, and the reason for that is because these subjects uh, that I'm going to cover in these two videos are very complex. Um, and so I felt it was uh, important to give them both their own videos, uh, th their own designated videos, in order to uh, properly give them the attention and justice they deserve. And today's subject is that of the First Creek War, a tale of the Cherokee American Alliance in the War of 1812 and its effects um, on not just the formation of the U.S., but also uh, the, uh, well, really all American Indian tribes, but especially the uh, five tribes of the Southeast. Um, and the War of 1812 itself is often considered a lesser known war nowadays, uh, and the Creek War is even more of a lesser known war than that. However, much like the War of 1812, the Creek War uh, is very important, uh, both in the history of the U.S. and the indigenous peoples of the Americas, uh, especially important for the indigenous peoples of the Americas, but it's also very important for the formation of the U.S. as a whole. So that's why uh, I'm going to cover it today. So with that, we're going to begin. So who are the Creek? Well, uh, for one thing, before I begin, uh, oftentimes the Creek uh, are, you know, considered um, by historians to have been the most powerful of the five tribes of the Southeast. However, I take issue with this because a lot of the uh, reasonings they give for that is that, uh, for example, the Creek had monopolies on trade with the U.S., British, uh, Spanish, and um, I believe the French Empire as well, but more the U.S., the British, and Spanish, uh, and that they uh, had an increase in population due to allowing refugees from tribes who had been displaced, such as the Lenape, also known as the Delaware, uh, the Shawnee, uh, the Natchez, etc. However, all of these reasons that are given are exactly the same for the Cherokee. The Cherokee had all of the exact same things. And in fact, as you see here on this map, they shared uh, comparable territories uh, in size um, for much of their history. So there is that. However, that aside, they were uh, at least one of the two most powerful tribes of the five tribes of the Southeast, uh, rivaling the Cherokee. Uh, and so with this, um, they developed uh, into a powerful both adversary and trading partner with the U.S. Um, to uh, explain a little more, the Creek are a confederation, or well, were uh, a confederation, and well, still are, but uh, at the time were a confederation of what are called Muskegee-speaking pe speaking peoples. Uh, Muskegon is a language. Um, and so they were a confederation of several different tribes who shared a common language and common culture. Um, and were able to uh, hold on to this large swath of territory consisting of northern Florida, most of Alabama, and a good chunk of Georgia, um, making them, again, both a powerful trading partner for the U.S., but also, uh, at least in the eyes of the U.S., because, of course, perception is not always fact, um, a large threat to their interests. Uh, and in fact, from the 1775 to 1794, the Creek participated with the Cherokee and the Choctaws and the Shawnee and the, Lon uh, and the Lenape uh, in a confederacy under Dragon Canoe and eventually uh, John Watts of the Cherokee in a fight against uh, the U.S. Uh, and also participated uh, as allies in battles such as the uh, Wabash or St. Clair's defeat with another powerful confederation of tribes, the um, Northwest no, Northwestern Confederacy and what was known as the Northwestern War. But by the time of from about 1794 or 1795, depending on your dates, uh, hey, what you count as the end of the war, uh, to um, the mid 1800s, uh, the Creek uh, and the Cherokee and the other tribes became very powerful trading partners with the U.S. However, uh, 
right about the mid of the 1800s, uh, well, the early 1800s, let me rephrase that, in the uh, early, about the mid 1810s, early 1810s, uh, this began to change. Uh, one of the reasons this began to change is the U.S. Would, had begun to expand even more than it had in the past. Um, because, yes, obviously in the past, in the Cherokee-American War, which I covered um, in a previous video, um, and the uh, Northwestern War against the uh, Northwestern Confederacy, which I also mentioned in the Cherokee-American War, uh, the U.S. had expanded um, much of its territory from just the what we know as the original 13 colonies uh, to the orange area, orangish yellow area that you see right here. However, uh, in the 1800s, 1804 um, and onwards, the U.S. actually began to purchase legally um, uh, territory from European nations, especially France, but also a little bit of Spain, um, gaining what we, <laughs> what the very famous Louisiana Purchase, <clears throat> uh, the Mississippi Territory, and the Indiana Territory. Uh, and then they also uh, took it upon themselves to claim what was known as Oregon country, which was an area that uh, was claimed by Great Britain, uh, the U.S., Russia, Spain, and also a little bit of France, uh, but mainly the U.S., Great Britain, Russia, and Spain. And it was an area that consisted of um, parts of Northern California, you know, a little bit of uh, Wyoming and Colorado and Utah and such, as well as modern day Colorado and Washington and huge swaths of Canada, or what is modern day Canada, because back then it wasn't called Canada. Um, and so uh, it was a very sought after place. Uh, so this allowed the US to practically, and well, literally double in size and practically, you know, overnight. Another key event that was going on at the time was an event known as the Napoleonic Wars, which saw a <coughs> scale of warfare in Europe that hadn't been seen uh, since the Thirty Years' War. Um, now, of course, there were larger wars that European countries had fought before then, especially the uh, Seven Years' War, also known as the French and Indian War, which literally spanned the globe. However, the European continents itself did not see uh, a scale, a war the scale, uh, of the scale until uh, this time. Um, and it happened after the French Revolution uh, when Napoleon uh, declared himself a dictator and then eventually emperor. Uh, and what, furthermore, this is different from the Thirty Years' War because the Thirty Years' War was basically a free for all between um, various nations who were also making alliances with each other and fighting uh, the alliances of other nations. But this was a single uh, unified conqueror who was coming out and taking over much of Europe. Uh, in, in some cases, such as um, Spain and I believe uh, Switzerland and such, uh, these were done through marriages or through political negotiations. But in other cases, such as Italy and Austria and the German uh, uh, principalities, such as the Kingdom of Prussia and the Confederation of the Rhine uh, and such, um, they were done through military conquest. And this uh, continued until Europe was, uh, for the most part, uh, controlled by Napoleon, which you can see here in the red outlines, uh, leaving the Ottoman Empire, um, places like uh, Wallachia uh, and Russia and Sweden and Britain and uh, other countries, uh, but being the ones who were um, still fighting. And so because of this increased warfare, um, political strife began to spread through the Western world, um, causing political tensions between the US and Britain especially, which we'll cover in the next video on the War of 1812, um, and even causing some uh, you know, political dissent in the Asian colonies, also uh, political dissent in French colonies such as Saint Domingue, uh, which is now Haiti, which I, as a video, I will cover, I will cover the Haitian Revolution uh, on one of my June, uh, Juneteenth videos. Um, so very politically, uh, very, very big era of political turmoil. And so at the backdrop of this age of political turmoil, an individual rose to prominence uh, named Tecumseh.
Now, Tecumseh was a warrior who had fought in the Northwestern War as well as in the Cherokee American War uh, under uh, Little Turtle um, and Blue Duck, uh, Blue Duck being a Shawnee and Little Turtle being a Miami who led the uh, Northwest Confederation um, and Dragon Canoe and John Watts and such who led the uh, Confederation um, of the Cherokee Creek, Choctaw, Lenape, and Shawnee. Uh, and he had fought in both of these wars and uh, took away from it from uh, Little Duck and, uh, sorry, Blue Duck and Little Turtle and, <coughs> excuse me, and Dragon Canoe, um, both of, all three of those individuals' ideas of a pan-Indian alliance, um, because many, they all felt that they could not drive away European powers if uh, it was just one drive at a time. And Tecumseh, was profoundly affected by these ideas and believed that uh, he too, uh, if need be, needed to create this pan-Indian alliance. Uh, and by the time of this age of turmoil, about uh, you know 20 years after the end of the Northwest War and the uh, America, Cherokee American War, he felt it was time for him and his brother, uh, Tenskwatawa, also known as the Prophet, to do this. Uh, to be fair, Tenskwatawa had already been in the process of doing of doing this, or at least of creating a you know less Europeanized uh, Shawnee tribe, and Tecumseh joined in and became one of the key leaders. Uh, and so, after Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh united many of the tribes of uh, what was then called the Northwest Territory or Indiana Territory, Tecumseh decided it was time to uh, go south and do the same thing. And so he ventured into what was then known as Mississippi Territory, but was also uh, Creek Territory and Choctaw Territory and uh, Chickasaw Territory, um, as well as a little bit of Cherokee Territory, uh, and began to preach to um, all of these tribes. Uh, also, could, preach is maybe not the right word, uh, but, um, or he would at least give uh, public speeches. And he was known as a very skilled orator. He was known for uh, how harrowing and how inspiring his public speeches could be. However, unfortunately, many of the tribes uh, chose not to ally with him. They felt, well, look, we're prospering under the trade with the U.S. and Britain and such. Why would we start a war with them? We've already been through a war. We showed, you know, we fought them to a draw. We showed how skilled we were. We don't need to do that again. Um, with many of the dissenter, key dissenters being uh, key players in the later War of 1812 and Creek War, such as Push Mataha, whom I'll cover in a minute. Um, however, there was a notable exception to this. And this was the Creek tribe, uh, because in one of the speeches he gave uh, in the Creek tribe, he took um, several red sticks uh, and took, you know, colored red, like clearly red, like the ones you see here, uh, and took one and broke it across his knee. And now I'm paraphrasing here uh, and said, see this red stick? See, is, see how I broke easily across my knee? This is us by ourselves. And then he took a bundle of red sticks and tied them together and tried the same thing, tried to break several sticks uh, across his leg. And he's like, can't do it. See, together we are strong, alone we are weak. Um, and apparently that had a profound effect on a lot of the Greek. Uh, however, they weren't completely convinced uh, even then. So Tecumseh said, I'm going to return to Prophetstown, uh, the town that he and his brother Chinsquatawa had built together, uh, and I will stamp my foot on the ground there, and all the houses in Creek territory, as well as in Choctaw and Cherokee and et cetera territory, will shake. Um, and when he returned to Prophetstown, uh, the, what, an event known as the New Madrid earthquake happened. Uh, the, the New Madrid fault um, slipped and caused an earthquake that was felt <coughs> throughout the southeast, literally shaking all of the houses in Greek country. And so uh, whether, you know, or not this was something because of Tecumseh or because of the uh, just the New Madrid fault, which is obviously the what actually happened, but still um, uh, was, you know, hard to determine. But in the eyes of the Greeks who had been uh, swayed by Tecumseh, this was enough. 
And so a variety of Creek war chiefs came together, such as William Weatherford, uh, Manawe, uh, and Apostle Yoholo, uh, and created the faction known as the Red Stick Creek Faction. And they together planned um, an attack on a fort known as Fort Mintz. It was a U.S. fort built in the Mississippi Territory, uh, and it's sort of a starting off point for possibly eventual uh, colonization of the area. And so William Weatherford, Manawe, and Apostle Yohola, and the various other Red Stick uh, war leaders gathered their forces and descended upon Fort Mims and slaughtered the garrison within. Unsurprisingly, uh, the U.S. government was not happy about this at all. And so they immediately began making plans uh, for war. Um, but the U.S. Army at the time was nowhere near uh, the size that it would be, say, in the Mexican-American War or the Civil War onwards. Um, so they were in need of allies. And the most clear allies they had were the tribes who had not sided with Tecumseh, the Choctaw, uh, the other half of the Creek faction known as the White Sticks, uh, and especially the powerful Cherokee Nation. And so together, the U.S. and the Cherokee Nation formed an alliance to go to march in with an expedition into uh, the territory controlled by the Red Stick Creeks and put this uh, Red Stick Creek faction down. Uh, and the head of this expeditionary force uh, was decided to be Major General Andrew Jackson, who then proceeded to gather a uh, army of uh, mostly militia, but also U.S. regulars, consisting uh, again mostly of Tennessean uh, volunteers, but also uh, volunteers from Georgia and South Carolina, um, consisting of, I believe, the count was between about 3,000 to 4,000, give or take. Um, volunteers. Uh, but uh, these were not the only forces he gathered. Uh, the Cherokee also provided uh, large numbers. Um, I think usually the uh, involvement of the Cherokee has been numbered to be about between 600 to 1,000 uh, warriors at any given time in this war. And some of the uh, prominent leaders of the Cherokee warriors were one, the principal chief of the Cherokee nation, Pathkiller, who was given the rank of colonel uh, almost immediately by Andrew Jackson, though to be fair, Pathkiller was too old to participate in the actual warfare at the time, so he still stayed relatively in the Cherokee nation. But then he also had another Cherokee who was given the rank of colonel, uh, Dick Taylor, um, and a individual whom I'll talk about a little bit later on in the video, uh, the Ridge, or, no, or he who walks among the ridges, um, who would eventually, who at first was a first lieutenant, but eventually through a variety of uh, uh, events that I'll again cover a little bit later in the video, was promoted to the rank of major. And all of these individuals, uh, all the Cherokee uh, ally auxiliary soldiers were placed under uh, the command of Brigadier General John Coffey. Uh, but it wasn't just Cherokee who were involved. As I said, half of the Creek Nation did not side with Tecumseh. Uh, these became known as the White Stick Faction. And um, generally, the White Stick Warriors who worked with the U.S. Expeditionary Force were led by William McIntosh, a Creek chief whom I talked briefly about in, uh, well, I'll talk more than briefly about in my video about Indian removal, which I'll include in the iCard. Uh, the Choctaw Warrior who uh, argued and disagreed with Tecumseh, uh, Pushmataha, uh, and a Choctaw chief whose name I will not attempt to pronounce because I will probably butcher it, uh, but generally just means determined to kill, determined to kill, though there are other translations. Um, and they brought together several hundred Creek and Choctaw warriors to also aid the expeditionary force. So <clears throat> uh, with this, uh, Andrew Jackson marched in with his expeditionary force consisting of Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina militia, uh, Cherokee, uh, mo mostly Cherokee, but also Creek and Choctaw warriors into Creek country to, and fought several uh, battles. Um, uh, several battles, uh, gaining some key victories, uh, but also some losses. Uh, and many of these expeditionary forces uh, included individuals who would eventually go on to be 
uh, very key players in American politics uh, and or in the politics of uh, areas that eventually would become states. Two notable individuals um, were Sam Houston, who was an ensign at the time, uh, and David Crockett, also known as Davy Crockett. And these individuals would come to be very key players in American politics, uh, with Sam Houston being both a senator and eventually uh, the first president of the Republic of Texas. And then David Crockett, uh, while being a scout at the time, eventually would go on to be a senator for Tennessee um, and would become known as a, become one of the most well known folk heroes in the US. <clears throat> However, uh, it should be noted that several individuals, such as these two, Sam Houston and David Crockett, um, did not come away the, with, from the Creek War with very fond memories. Some went in it, in it for glory and got the glory they were looking for, but some, such as David Crockett and Sam Houston, did not. Uh, and this can be seen, uh, especially in David Crockett's <clears throat> excuse me, uh, autobiography where he very honestly talks about a massacre that he participated in, where uh, he says, and I quote, they ambushed uh, Creek warriors after having been starving for weeks. Uh, apparently they hit his uh, brigade had not eaten in days and were so were hungry. Uh, and when they came across these uh, uh, about four, uh, 46 uh, warriors, as you can see here in this excerpt, uh, they ambushed and attacked them, and in his words, they shot them like dogs. Um, he doesn't say we shot the Indians or we saw, shot these savages. He says we shot them like dogs, which is interesting because most people would have said we shot these savages or anything like that. And then he talks about how they burned them in a house, um, and eventually, while looking for food, they came across um, a cellar full of potatoes uh, that had been cooked in their grease. And yes, I mean the grease of the Greek warriors in there. And in his own words, uh, mo they uh, hunger compelled uh, us to eat them, though I had a little rather not if I could have helped it for the oil of the Indians we had burned up on the day before had run down on them and they had looked like they had been stewed with fat meat. So in other words, his brigade ate the potatoes cooked in the fat of these Creeks with the exception of him, um, or at least that's how I take it. You may take it differently, but it seems very clearly that he chose not to eat it. Um, and so taking this together, um, it seems that uh, he was very much not happy with uh, the events he had been part of, um, especially considering the way he describes it, uh, it looked like it had been stewed with fat meat. There may have been human pieces of human attached to them too, but I can't prove that, but that's the way it sounds. Uh, so it's clear, as I'll cover a, late, a little later in the video, <laughs> that this um, was not a high point for, in, in, at least in the eyes of Davy Cro uh, Davy Crockett, David Crockett, as he preferred, life. <clears throat> and this shows just how brutal uh, the Creek War was. Um, it was a very brutal uh, massacre, essentially, perpetrated by the U.S. Uh, and eventually, uh, Andrew Jackson would make uh, Fort Williams his main base to sort of uh, continue these battles. Because um, obviously, you, most uh, campaigns require a um, staging point, and this was his. He built uh, Fort Williams and stationed most of his uh, men, including the Cherokee and Creeks there. However, not every battle was a success. Um, and that was because uh, there was an, in, well, let me rephrase this, issues with um, recruitment as well as issues with desertion uh, were endemic in his army. Also as issues with morale, and they often times didn't, as you saw in uh, the excerpt uh, from David Crockett's autobiography, they oftentimes didn't even have enough food to feed every brigade. <laughs> so famine and starvation was common. So because of that, people would often desert to go back home, or it would be difficult to recruit more men for the expedition. And furthermore, uh, battle, uh, several in, uh, inconclusive battles, such as the Battle of Antichokopo, um, happened where 
in this case, uh, while he was able to drive off a couple of uh, minor uh, assaults of for, from Creek war bands, uh, Andrew Jackson realized that the main Creek war band in the area outnumbered him and his men. So he was forced to retreat uh, to Fort Struther for um, the winter, uh, where he did not perform any more uh, military activities. However, uh, the Cherokee and the, especially the Cherokee uh, and the Creek Kinshaka warriors uh, did not rest during this time. And in fact, in the words of John Coffey himself, the most effective warriors in Andrew Jackson's army were the Cherokee warriors, uh, as well as the Creek and the Choctaws, but again, mostly the Cherokee. Um, and many of these warriors <laughs> gained very, uh, gained high notoriety during this time. Some of them didn't, but um, they, they oftentimes Cherokee were able to become famous. Uh, in fact, Major Ridge, as I said, is an example. He started off as a first lieutenant, but due to the victories that he kept winning, and he kept winning uh, victory after victory after victory against the Red Stick Creek faction, and so eventually due to his bravery and his skill as a commander, Andrew Jackson promoted him <laughs> all the way from lieutenant to major, to the rank of major. And so the Ridge, uh, liking the rank of major so much, kept the name major and became Major Ridge. Uh, other Cherokee who were notable during this time uh, were uh, General Liska, who was a, a private, uh, but he was a very skilled warrior. Um, and he eventually became a uh, member of the Cherokee Council, uh, became a lesser chief uh, in the Cherokee Council. And he was a very brave warrior and often viewed as very brave. However, I should say that he, the um, uh, story that is often told of him saving Andrew Jackson at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend from a tomahawk is most likely not true because the only record we have of it shows up in the late 1830s, early 1840s, when uh, General Liska was trying to uh, come up, was basically he was, he had not, still not been given his, um, a uh, commission from fighting in the War of 1812. Oh, that was endemic for a lot of Turkey uh, warriors who served in the War of 1812. Uh, and you often had to come up with a reason why you should get your commission from the US government. And so uh, the one account we have of that uh, shows up in the 1840s when General Liska was trying to get his commission. So it seems he made it up. And as I will describe in a little bit, uh, he may have stolen it from a different Cherokee warrior. <clears throat> uh, and then another individual who, uh, while remained mostly um, obscure during the War of 1812, though he did gain notoriety for a couple of acts of bravery, uh, would, have, would eventually become the principal chief of the Cherokee. And that was John Ross, who was a, a yet another private, or I believe a corporal. Um, and then another very key individual uh, was Sequoia, who was a private at the time and would eventually uh, developed the Cherokee writing system, the Cherokee syllabary. And his, one of his stated reasons is because he noticed how um, the uh, Red Stick Creeks, as well as the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, and even the Cherokee themselves would often suffer, uh, commu suffer communication issues due to their lack of a writing system, or at least the lack of a writing system um, for the most part. There were use of petroglyphs and such before them, but they were often say in areas like uh, Track Rock Gap and such that you were in very stagnant areas. So they often did not have writing that you could say send a letter or a telegram or anything like that. And so that's what inspired him to um, create the Cherokee writing system. He was able to, or one of the reasons, he had other inspirations, but that was one of the inspirations for it. Uh, in fact, um, as I said, uh, many of the, uh, uh, much of the military force of Jackson was made up by Cherokee. His his expeditionary force was around between two to four thousand at any given point in time, and oftentimes, and in given point in time, uh, the uh, Cherokee and other uh, Allied Indian forces would consist between of eight hundred and uh, between six hundred and um, a thousand. And so, when you have an army that's only about 4,000 large, that's still a significant part of the military. That's still a significant part of the army. And now to be fair, this is just, this muster roll here that I have here is just from uh, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. 
Um, and there's a copy of the muster roll in one of my sources that I will link in uh, uh, sources. Uh, but you can see here just from two pages out of 15, how, just how many were enlisted. And you can see the Ridge right here, or Major Ridge as he's known, and uh, John Ross, uh, and etc. So there were quite a lot of them who had enlisted. Some of them didn't always stay for the full time. Uh, some of them went home, you know, say during the winter and such, but a great many of them continued to fight through the, the entirety of the war. And they made up a significant amount of um, Major Ridge, sorry, not Major Ridge, of Andrew Jackson's expeditionary force. Again, you know, most of them were made up of Tennesseans and Georgians, but it's still a significant amount. <clears throat> Eventually, uh, once the winter was over, uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, with his expeditionary force, can you know his combined expeditionary force, was able to force the main Red Stick Creek um, army uh, and corner them in the village of, of Topahika, which is uh, was located on the Talapusa River in an area known as Horseshoe Bend, which you can see why it's in the shape of a horseshoe. And so Andrew Jackson uh, started his army right here, uh, which this is actually the bottom of a hill. I've been to Horseshoe Bend. It's a very uh, beautiful site, a very fascinating site, and it's awe-inspiring. Uh, this is, again, the top of a hill, so this is a very steep hill. And he uh, stationed his men uh, at the bottom of the hill um, and prepared to lay siege to a very uh, well-built barricade. <clears throat> and he uh, did just that. He took all of his cannons and he opened fire on the barricade, firing for hours, just pummeling this barricade and what he had hoped was submission. Uh, but <laughs> when the smoke cleared after his last uh, bombardment, he saw to his amazement, none of the wall was damaged at all. Like the cannons did nothing. Uh, and it left him in bewilderment. So now he, he couldn't just go straight forward because most of the Creek warriors were on these walls and he and his men would just get torn to shreds, especially running uphill. Uh, and the cannons were doing nothing. Uh, so it sort of sat at a stalemate for a few hours. However, um, a rear guard, uh, well, not a rear guard, that's a reserve line. However, a different uh, contention of Jackson's expeditionary force was stationed here on the other side, originally to prevent escape. Um, because Jackson again thought he was going to blast through this barricade and storm up the hill. Uh, but seeing that the majority of the uh, Creek war band was at the edge of the wall and seeing that the U.S. Army hadn't um, stormed in yet, the Cherokee decided to take uh, matters into their own hands, specifically an individual known as the whale, uh, called that because of his um, skill and swing. And he decided to swim across the river uh, and pull canoes across. Uh, and he did this, of course, with covering fire from the Cherokee and the Creek and the Choctaw. Again, most of them were Cherokee, uh, and led by Major Ridge. Um, and eventually, after gathering enough <coughs> uh, canoes, the Cherokee and the uh, Allied Creeks and Choctaw began swimming, uh, began not swimming, uh, rowing across until eventually around 200 to 300 Cherokee and uh, 100 or so Creek and Choctaws were over uh, on the other side. And they began to charge the battlements and a massive battle ensued. Uh, one of the uh, fights in this battle is the most likely uh, inspiration that John Aleska had for his story about saving Andrew Jackson. Again, that story is probably not true. And this was an, <laughs> a situation that Major Ridge found himself in. <clears throat> and so Major Ridge was fighting um, several Creek warriors, and he was uh, the count was about three, uh, according to the records. Uh, after killing two, uh, he ran out of ammo and his pistols and his musket, uh, and so he realized he had forgotten his own knife, uh, and when the Creek warrior charged him, he grabbed the knife uh, from him and stabbed him in the gut. However, apparently he only hit a, uh, either a fatty part or, you know, if he did nick something like the liver or anything like that, um, 
it wasn't enough damage to put the creek down. So they were wrestling and fighting. And eventually two other, two or three other creek noticed this. And so they began charging him with their uh, tomahawks while the creek he was wrestling with was also, was pulling out the knife that was in his gut and was about to stab Major Ridge with it. Luckily, um, several creek, sorry, sorry, several Cherokee and allied creek warriors noticed this and uh, shot and killed the creek warriors who were charging him and then uh, bayoneted to death uh, the creek warrior that uh, Major Ridge was wrestling with, uh, therefore saving his life uh, and such. So again, that's the most likely, <laughs> it, it sounds very similar to Joan Aleska's story about saving Andrew Jackson. Anyways, so with this melee going on between the Cherokee uh, and White Stick Creeks uh, against the uh, Red Stick Creeks, Eventually, Andrew Jackson noticed that very few of the Red Sea Creeks were still stationed on the barricade wall. And so he realized, now's my chance, and he ordered all of his forces, all of his uh, 3,000 other forces on the other side to storm the ramparts, <coughs> excuse me, and eventually uh, won the battle, uh, with most of the creek uh, in the area being captured. Um, a few were able to get away, including uh, Manawe, who, uh, according to the accounts, played dead. And then once all the U.S. and uh, allied uh, American Indian fighters were back in their camps, he swam across the river in the cover of night. Um, and with this, uh, because of his contributions to Jackson's victory, uh, the whale, <coughs> excuse me, eventually was awarded um, this very finely decorated Kentucky, uh, Kentucky gun with his own name on it. However, to be fair, it took him several years to get it and constantly pestering the U.S., uh, but eventually he did get it. And so after this battle, uh, the various Red Stick Creek leaders, such as uh, Apotho Yohola, Monaway, and William Weatherford, who's the individual you see here, eventually negotiated with Andrew Jackson and surrendered and signed what was known as the uh, Treaty of Fort Jackson. And with that, a lot of the creek land that made up mostly central Alabama and a good chunk of southern Alabama and uh, most of the most southwestern and south central part of Georgia, though a lot of creek lands were still in here. In fact, William McIntosh lived around here. Uh, therefore, opening up these areas for Georgia colonization. Um, it should also be noted that there's part of it, the creek uh, secession that hasn't showed up here that was right about here. Uh, but still, uh, opening a lot, a large swaths of uh, the Alabama, modern day Alabama and modern Georgia for settlement from Georgia colonists. However, it didn't really necessarily in here because uh, Andrew Jackson uh, tried to forge documents <laughs> making. Red Cherokee land looked like Red Stick Creek land, uh, but Major Ridge uh, was able to stop him and said, no, if you want to do it legally, take it up with the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation, Path Killer, uh, and then he proceeded to take the documents to Washington, D.C. and made President James Madison change them back anyway. Um, <clears throat> so there was that uh, little bit of argument, uh, argumentation and such over which lands were actually creek. Um, however, it should also be noted that this, while this was the end of the Creek War itself, it wasn't the end of the uh, Cherokee-U.S. Um, alliance. As uh, Andrew Jackson decided, it was time to remove the British from Florida, as the British had made, signed an alliance with Spain and had stationed some uh, soldiers in uh, Florida forts, such as Pensacola. And so Andrew Jackson with his expeditionary force and uh, allied uh, Cherokee Choctaw and Creek warriors marched into Florida um, and defeated Britain at Pensacola and drove them completely out of uh, the, at least this section of Florida. So that officially ended the, um, at least temporarily, uh, there will be there were other alliances that I'll cover in my next video on the War of 1812 and more details and more fit with the broader War of 1812, but this was the overall end of the uh, Cherokee, uh, Choctaw, and White Sea Creek Alliance with the U.S. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> the effects of this war would be felt, would be felt for decades. Uh, for one, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, 
uh, it allowed for uh, Georgia and Tennessee and other colonists, uh, other settlers to move into large swaths of territory in what is now modern day uh, South Georgia and Alabama. Um, something that was not open originally uh, and put in, put more uh, of the indigenous tribes at danger. Furthermore, Andrew Jackson's uh, actions in the trying to forge documents, as well as his racism against um, uh, the various American Indian tribes, uh, because he was always racist, though to be fair, as with his promotion with Nature Ridge, uh, he was willing to acknowledge when they were uh, competent warriors, but still, uh, his racism eventually led to uh, the furtherment of the ideas of the Indian removal, as the ideas of Indian removal had actually been first proposed by Thomas Jefferson, but Andrew Jackson was one of the biggest proponents, and he himself kept recycling it. And eventually, this led to uh, the Indian Removal Act as it, uh, itself. <laughs> However, to be fair, uh, many of the veterans of the War of 1812 uh, were actually against Indian removal. Not all of them, because many of them were also for it, but many such as David Crockett and Sam Houston were vehemently against it. Uh, in fact, David Crockett was one of the most vocal opponents to Indian removal, saying in, in this speech here that I've linked in the sources, um, essentially, uh, that he would uh, sign Indian removal uh, in this little paragraph right here, <clears throat> it, only if the tribes uh, themselves wanted it. He lived near Chickasaw country, and he would. He said he would never, you know, drive them from their homes. He would never do the, any of these horrible things to them. Uh, without their being willing to go. They, he said they have to be willing to go. They have to be, it has to be their idea. He's like, I will not, um, essentially he was said, um, <clears throat> uh, no man could be more willing to see them removed than he was if it could be done in a manner agreeable to themselves, but not otherwise. He knew personally that part of the tribe of the Cherokees were unwilling to go. When the, promo the proposal was made to them, they said, no, we will take death here at our homes. Let them come and tomahawk us here at home. We are unwilling to die. Uh, we are willing to die, but never to remove. And so that's essentially what David Crockett was trying to get across. He's like, we will, he's like, we will not. He's like, I will not allow you to slaughter these tribes. They don't want to leave. We don't need to make them leave. It is their land. But of course, his um, speech, which again, uh, the mo the one of the most important parts is this paragraph right here um, that you can pause and read, uh, fell on deaf ears, especially to Andrew Jackson and his constituents. However, while uh, Indian the Indian Removal Act was passed, um, it was highly contentious. Again, indicative of the people who had fought alongside the tribe uh, with the House of Representatives vote, for example, being 10, uh, I believe like 102 to 97 or something like that. So very close. And, you know, individuals like Sam Houston and David Crockett hated it. Uh, the Moravian uh, missionaries uh, in Georgia and in uh, much of the New World, they were German, hated it, etc. So that's something to always remember that, unfortunately, the War of 1812, uh, one, it allowed for the U.S. to expand it more um, into the Mississippi Territory, which it had already technically bought, but again, hadn't settled yet. But it also uh, practically immediately put um, the so-called five civilized tribes in danger, which is another th effect of the War of 1812. Uh, eventually, after this war, the Chickasaw Choctaw Creek Seminole and Cherokee decided it was best to attempt to assimilate into American and European culture in the hopes that they wouldn't be um, uh, removed like David Crockett was describing. Of course, it was never about how American they looked. It was always about racism. But this uh, increase in revival of the Indian Removal Act was in direct uh, relation to the War of 1812. <clears throat> so was the expansion of the U.S. as a whole. So with that, uh, that ends the video. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you have any other lesser conflicts uh, in US history that you would like me to cover, 
uh, please let me know in the comments. Um, and remember to always like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you have a good day.